to the Experts on Expert webinar. My name is Amelia Alanis. I'm a program manager at the Curry Center. And today we have almost 400 participants. Today's session is being recorded and will be archived on our website. Please look out for an email announcing when it has become available in two to three weeks. You have all been placed on mute in order to preserve the quality of the recording. If you have questions or comments during the webinar, please feel free to share them in the chat box. If you are listening via the phone, please enter the code provided to you within Adobe Connect to link your phone and your computer if you haven't already done so. This webinar is produced by the Curry International Tuberculosis Center, which is part of the University of California, San Francisco and located in Oakland, California. The Curry Center is one of four TB centers of excellence for training, education, and medical consultation. We cover the western region of the U.S., which is shown in purple on the map. Our region consists of 17 jurisdictions and also includes the U.S. Pacific Island territories. This project was funded by the CDC's Cooperative Agreement and is a project of the University of California, San Francisco. The Curry Center is accredited by the ACCME to provide continuing medical education for physicians. The Curry Center is also an approved provider of continuing education by the California State Board of Registered Nurses. This webinar is approved for a total of 1.5 continuing education contact hours. To receive your continuing education contact hours, you must have registered for the webinar, participated in the entire training, and complete the online evaluation. The web link for the evaluation was emailed to all registered course participants this morning. We ask that you please complete it within one week. Pre-registration is important so that we can ensure we don't exceed capacity of the webinar system. However, as mentioned on an earlier slide, if individuals or group members have not pre-registered, please enter their name and email in the chat box window so they can receive the evaluation link and be eligible to receive credit. For those who complete all the required steps, your CME or CEU certificates or, or certificates of participation will be available on the Curry Center website within 12 weeks. Today's faculty have signed a declaration of disclosure and have indicated that they have nothing to disclose. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the faculty for today's webinar, Dr. Penn and Barry and Grace Lynn. Hi. Go ahead. Good morning. Well, um, it's really a pleasure um, to be here. I'm uh, Penn and Barry. I'm a clinician consultant at the California Department of Public Health TB Control Branch, um, where I um, work with uh, colleagues on the MDR consult service, uh, among other duties. And it's really a pleasure to be here with uh, Grace, uh, with whom um, I've worked uh, for the last uh, almost a decade, uh, but just the end of her decades of experience in uh, clinical mycobacteriology. And uh, so hopefully we uh, will be able to justify this, uh, this title, Experts on Expert. I'm the clinician. Uh, Grace will be the lab laboratorian, and this will be uh, very much a uh, discussion between us. Yes. Uh, thanks, Tannen. Well, intro. Uh, since you joined the state, we have had a lot of fun working together. Definitely. Especially when we are discussing lab results. That can be very challenging, uh, but at the same time, rewarding. Okay. That's why we have to talk a lot, right? Grace? Right, right. And we have learned uh, from each other a lot. Definitely. Okay. And uh, have you mentioned I have experience with molecular beacons? 
I neglected to say that uh, Grace in particular fits this uh, title because she was involved in uh, some of the early development of uh, some of the molecular beacon technology used in the expert uh, assay um, for identifying rifampin-resistant mutations. Well, a little bit more, more than that. Okay, so back in uh, 2001, I came to work for state. It was because a molecular beacon project uh, sponsored by CDC. Okay. And after one and a half years hard working, eventually we developed a beacon test for detecting resistance to INH and rifampin. Uh, we put a test to work from 2003 till uh, 2012. And many of you in the audience um, ordered the beacon test in the past. And the test we're going to discuss expert MTD brief test is also a beacon test. Um, although it's different from ours, but using the same technology. So I'm sure we're going to have a lot of hands on experience to share with you. Hannah, how about let's go? <laughs> let's go. Um, okay, so um, just to review the learning objectives for today that uh, have been in all of the other uh, training materials. Um, again, we have uh, no disclosures. I uh, just want to review that um, this today we're really not going to be doing an introduction to the expert assay um, or uh, talking about how to use it for um, other things like release from respiratory isolation. What we are going to do is um, talk about expert and how it works. We're going to look under the hood a little bit to uh, see what's going on. Um, and how we can um, understand some of the nuances through some case discussions between, about, between us. We're hoping that you will be able to take out, uh, take from this um, when to ask for more information from your lab or when to order additional testing. Um, and in certain cases when you probably have all the information that you're going to get and uh, when you don't have to order additional tests. Um, I think uh, it's true that uh, both Grace and I uh, would agree, no matter um, the issues that we bring up later, that we both, uh, I think, have uh, agreed that uh, Expert has been a great tool for TB detection. Um, it is an FDA-approved uh, test, and it shortens time significantly, not only from uh, specimen collection to uh, TB diagnosis, also to uh, TB treatment, but it also shortens the laboratory time needed to do the test. Uh, so only about two and a half hours. And I understand, Grace, right? It's a pretty easy test uh, yeah. to perform. So uh, the assay is based on real-time PCR. And there are five molecular beacon probes that cover the 81 base pair core region of the RPOB gene. And you can see in that diagram that uh, I've put up there at the bottom of your screen these five probes um, uh, overlap uh, in some cases and cover this entire uh, region of, uh, of the core uh, gene. Now I think uh, we're throughout this what we're going to try to bring a sense of realism um, to what we show. So here we're including all of the illegibility resulting from multiple faxing and scanning. Um, but no doubt uh, this looks familiar to many of you. So this is an expert clinical report. Seems like in black and white it says mycobacterium tuberculosis complex detected and a mutation in the RPOB gene has been detected indicating possible rifampin resistance. So this is what uh, we see most of the time in our public health departments or as clinicians. Um, but Actually, in the laboratory, uh, Grace, right, you see much more than that. Um, mm -hmm. And we're showing uh, basically what you see in the lab uh, on the screen now. Yeah, that's right. OK, this is uh, the report um, come from the expert computer after the test is done. Um, it looks much busier than what you get. Yeah, right? it looks really complicated, actually. <laughs> right, OK. So, but we will highlight uh, some important critical part, so it won't be too bad, okay? Um, if you get a report that 
MTB uh, complex detected, if not detected, you will never need to see this. Okay. But when you call me or email me saying that an expert report to you that uh, RIF resistant detected, then the first thing I will ask you is that, could you please fax me the expert report? Okay. So um, something important is hidden here. Um, let, let's, let's go ahead to, to take a, a quick look. Okay. So the top portion uh, is the summary of the results. It tells you uh, NTB detected, and sometimes it's not. Okay. And then risk detected or not. And um, here. I would say MTBC, not MTB. Okay, so we're going to clarify that later. Okay, and the mid section um, is actually the important one. Okay, so it shows you the detailed uh, results of each probe with CT values. Remember CT. We're going to talk about it a lot later. Okay, <laughs> and. Um, the bottom uh, section is the graph. It shows you the curve of signals produced by um, each probe. Actually, this is a separate report. Uh, yeah. Okay. So we want to have plenty ex examples of CTs and graphs, and I'm sure you will become experts. <laughs> That's right. So, so. Um, Grace, what you're saying, the top is basically what ends up on the reports that we get as clinicians, but the, the meat, and I think what we're going to be talking a lot about today, is in that middle part, the CT values. Right, right. Um, so let's, um, hopefully you can tell us a little bit more about, uh, about the methodology, about real-time PCR. Yeah, sure. Okay. So real-time PCR has two major components. It's the traditional PCR and then plus probe, you know, yeah. And what does PCR do? Okay, PCR, the major work is to um, amplify to produce many copies of the specific segment of DNA, okay. And as you can see from the top right, you know, each cycle, the amplicon, you know, doubles, okay. And how about the probe? So basically, it tells us that, okay, the specific sequence you want is present or not present. And on the um, bottom right, okay, and you can see, you know, when the probe binds to amplicons, generates signal. And as PCR progress, more and more amplicons produced, and the uh, signal will um, get stronger and stronger. But for some reason, sometimes proof doesn't bind to it. And then we'll talk, talk about it. When uh, proof will bind, will not bind, you know, yeah. Okay. Okay, so let me make sure, Grace, that I, that I understand this, taking me back to, I think, some uh, college science courses. So just, just on this, focusing on this PCR cycle, since we're going to be talking about cycle thresholds, Right, this is what happens. We start on the left side of the graph with a single piece of double-stranded DNA, and from what I understand, there are um, cycles of temperature that, um, that splits those, uh, those uh, bound strands apart, and then our primers and our enzymes can create copies in each cycle. And so each cycle, right, it doubles, and so we have one copy at the uh, start of cycle one, two copies at cycle two, four copies at the beginning of cycle three and eight here. So what I think I, I understand from this is that it really depends a lot how many copies or how much DNA we have at the beginning of this process on how many cycles it takes to get a large number of uh, copies, in this case, the, of the RPOV gene. Am I understanding yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, right. That's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah. but we don't actually know that this process is successful in that expert cartridge without the probes binding and telling us um, that we actually have these copies there. Is that right? Right. The the traditional you know PCR you have to run cells to see in a specific band is there or not. But uh, real time PCR you don't have to 
do that. So the probe served as a reporter. Okay. And you know, at the end of the PCR, the data is there for you to analyze. In okay. that graph. It, yeah. And, and you know, um, Jim Exper even you know, says it better. Um, we don't have to analyze. It analyzes for us. Okay. Right, right. But, but there's a trade off, okay? When things too simple, okay? You know, sometimes we have to figure out does expert give us real results or not? That's why we are here. That's yeah. why we have to look under the hood. Okay, yeah. well, can you tell us a little bit more about the, these probes? Yeah, okay. So we know expert use uh, uh, molecular beacon. Okay. So molecular beacon has a, a special structure, we call it hairpin. Um, it has a head and two arms. The head is the functional part. And in so you our mean case, that's where the RPOB um, right. uh, sequence is. Right, right. Yeah. And but it's short, okay. You know, um, that's why you know, 81 base pair. Um, it has to cut to make it five probes, okay. Yeah. And then you saw the the two lines, the white white parts. Those are two arms, okay. And each arm, you know, uh, one arm has four for attached, and the other arm has quencher attached, okay. And these two arms, nothing to do with RPOB or whatever, okay. They are complementary to each other. So when are when they are resting, okay, the two arms will bind to each other. So the flow of four will be right next to the quencher, and no light, no signal will be emitted. So those arms just keep the light turned off, essentially, so, if it's right, not bound. Right, right, right. Got it. Okay. okay. And then let's see how it works when you put the DNA in. Okay. Okay. So in the beginning, okay, you put the um, probes there, primers there, and then whatever, okay. And then you put the, um, the organism from your patient in there. And vegan is very choosy because of this hairpin structure. Okay. So if it sense that the organism has the mutation in there, it's not complementary to its head sequence. Very choosy, very selective. It will not bind to it. Okay. So if it does not bind to it, then what? You know, the arm still stuck together and no signal will produce. Okay. But if your patient's organism, um, no mutation has a wild type, okay, and the beacon head is very healthy, okay, I'm going to bind to it, okay. And then because the, the beacon sequence is much longer than the arms, okay, so cannot compete with the um, attraction from the amplicon, so the arms are forced to open up. When the arms open up, what happens? What then happens? you get light. Then it turns the light on. Yes, that's yeah. correct. Yeah. And the PCR, uh, the real-time PCR instrument has the camera. We call it chart coupled device, CCD, can recording this, and then that's why you see the signal on the graph. I see. So it's important to remember then that signal on the graph means wild type sequence, um, not mutant sequence, because I think we can get that right, right. Well, sometimes. Well, that means your beacon head is wild type. How about, you know, okay, here, when beacon, when you don't see signals, we know mutation is, is present, but we don't know what mutation, right? So how about I ask you? Uh, can I make a beacon with the mutant sequence and then you can detect the specific mutation? Sure, I see. So you could design a beacon that was designed specifically to identify a mutation, but that's not how the current expert works. That's right. But yeah. why? Why? Okay. For example, in our MDL, okay, we already detected more than 50 different mutations. If you're going to that the your folks, Physicians know about specific mutations, if not, you know, uh, silent mutation or whatever, you know, you will be happy to, to do that, right? But is that practical? You're going to make 50, 60 beacons, okay? So it's not practical. So 
uh, said that is correct using the strategy that you know design the deacon using web type. And of course, you know, the resentment resistance right now is less than two percent, right? So okay. so I think that makes total sense to, you know, uh, just have a uh, wild type, you know, because and then we know, okay, signal is there, we know it's wild type, signal there is mutant, and then we have to use sequencing method to um, to identify what is there. So it will be less than 2%. Right. So I think that's an important point is that um, we, we aren't able to tell the specific sequence with the expert assay. And so if we get a result showing rifampin resistance, we should order a sequencing-based test, such as pirate sequencing at MDL in your lab or MDDR at CDC or whole genome sequencing at Wadsworth right. Center, right. Uh, right. et cetera. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, Grace, um, I've always been a little bit confused, I have to say, about the CC value. And I know that that is kind of the linchpin of what we're going to talk about um, today. So um, let's just walk through a little bit um, about what is the CC value and how can we identify it from um, the data available to us in experts. Yeah, okay, so first, CT stands for uh, threshold cycle. And that specific cycle, the signal produced by probe cross the threshold. So let's take a look at uh, this blue line, okay. And you can see the signal start to getting up maybe around cycle 12, and then as Amplicon, you know, uh, gets more and more, and the the um, the signal cross the threshold at 18, so we call CT value 18. Okay. So that's the cycle at which there's now enough copies of this gene to create enough light to rise above this threshold of uh, background light to um, to uh, be identified basically yeah, yeah. by the assay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So how about the second one, the purple line? You want to? Oh, okay, yeah. sure, sure. Let me see if I can if I can figure it out. So, in this one, it looks like um, uh, the, the PCR value is um, is uh, <laughs> PCR reactions are occurring, but it takes up to cycle 25 this time. <laughs> Um, and so um, the CT value for this curve um, is actually uh, and I think that, 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 um, um, that there actually was less DNA in the original specimen for this purple curve than for the blue curve. Is that Yeah, a, that's, that's that right? correct. Yeah, because okay. the starting line, you have that, you know, then, then PCR will, you know, uh, generally less amplicon, right? Okay, great. Okay. Let's see another example. Another example, sample three. Okay, here are you. Okay, so <laughs> so sample three is, looks very different. The curve doesn't ever rise above the threshold, and so I guess based on the animation you showed before, this must mean that there's a mutation, um, and so the, the probe didn't ever bind, and so we don't get any light produced. Is right, that right? Right, 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 yeah. But that's one possibility. Oh, there are more possibilities. Right, okay. right. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so no signal, signals we know. You know. Mutation present. But how about other possibilities? You know? Uh, MTBC DNA insufficient or not present? Okay. So we are pushing hard to test smear negative samples, right? So if the PCR could not generate enough amplicon, you know, then the probe won't have enough to find to generate enough signal to cross the threshold. So if the expert did not detect an MTBC, does not rule out MTB. So it could, there could be enough there to actually culture out eventually, but there's yeah. not enough DNA for this PCR reaction to generate enough copies to be detectable in that. Right, right, yeah. Got it. 
And then how about smear positive? Okay, we know there's tons of DNA there, right? And then you still don't have the signal. That means what? That's right, maybe it's in NTM. Or it's not yeah. in TV complex anyway. Right, right, right. Okay, so you said there are three possibilities. What's the what's the third? Okay, one? inhibitory substance present. That's basic. You know, no matter how many you know DNA copies to start with, uh, it just prohibits PCR to do its work. Okay, but luckily that expert has internal control. You know, specimen processing control SPC to detect uh, inhibitory substance. So we really don't have to worry about this with expert as long as the expert readout is telling us we have a valid result. Right, and then it doesn't have the you know um, inhibition. Okay. Right? Yeah. Okay, that's good. All right. Well, what else can we learn from what's going on under the hood of the expert assay? Right. Yeah, we said that the expert um, uh, interpret result for us, right? So there must be some rules, right? And there are quite a bit, because we put out the two most important and then most practical and then easy to remember, okay? Great. So if, okay, expert said NTBC detected, you know, well actually it says very low threshold. Only two probes become positive, then it qualifies to say NTBC detected. So we only need two of those curves to go up to for the assay to say that. Yeah, it's two out of five. Yeah. You know, okay. Yeah. And how about risk resistant detected? Okay. Of course, if the the probe doesn't bind, you have the uh, CC zero, right? Okay. But sometimes you still have some signals. You know. Yeah. So the uh, difference of CC value between the highest value minus the lowest value is greater than four. We call it delta. CC maximum greater than four, then experts say, okay, we've resistant detected. Yeah. And that sounds a little complicated, so I'm glad yeah. we're gonna we're gonna have some examples later. I think. Right, right, okay. right. Yeah, and then there are more in the package insert. You know, how to interpret indeterminate or whatever. So you can see more there. Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, let's let's go on and see some examples of some typical expert results, and we'll look at uh, what you can see in the, the lab computer. Um, so these are the most straightforward kind of situations that we've chosen. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah. We will test it out. Okay, yeah. great. So here's the, here's the first one. So um, can you walk us through this one, Grace? Okay, so what do you guys see? Okay, uh, only the SPC has CT. That means so that's yeah. the yellow curve here. Right. That's the only one going up. Right, right. And then, but that tells you the, the test is valid. Okay. But all other, you know, A, B, C, D, uh, no signals. Well, what, what do you think that means? Right, I see. So the, there are no CT values are all zero. And um, down here, there's actually, we don't see any of these other curves going right. up. So right. uh, based on what you told us before, it means there's, there wasn't enough MTB DNA, right. or there was zero MTB DNA in that specimen to right. call it right. MTB. So right. this would be negative for MTB. TB, yeah, MTBC not detected. Okay. Okay. And um, no probe signals. And okay. Right. So it was a valid test, but it was a negative test. Right. Negative right. result. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's look at this one. What do you think about this one, Grace? This one. Or uh, I would like to ask you. <laughs> oh, you want me to go through this one? Okay, sure. So uh, here, um, it looks like, unlike the last one, we have uh, CT values that are all greater than zero. So we have yeah. good CT values. And when we look down at the curves, we see all five probes have uh, amplification there. Uh, going back to the curve from before, I see that the CT values are all above 30, yeah. so pretty high CT values. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that means, you know, um, the starting DNA concentration is very low. So, very likely this is a smear negative sediment. I see. Okay, but mm -hmm. in terms of, so this is MTB complex because we have more than two probes that 
have CT values and have curves. Right. Um, but I think it's not rifampin resistant because we don't have a difference, a uh, large difference between these two, between the set of, right. of curves. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So let's see the highest uh, CT value is 33.9, the lowest is 31.8, so it's 2.1, it's less than 4. It this is this delta CT max uh, that yeah. you were talking about before, so right, right. that's how the computer determines the rifampin. Yeah. Uh, okay, so rifampin is susceptible in this example. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Are we, do we feel pretty confident about this result? Um, because of the high CT values? Um, I do, because, you know, and then also from the graph, you can see, you know, the uh, signals were, you know, produced pretty evenly, you know, yeah. And the, the CT value were kind of close to each other, you know, so, and then the FTC has, you know, good, you know, CT there, it's positive. Okay. So, no problem, I trust this very much. Okay, that's helpful. All right, let's see uh, one other example here. Um, and um, this one, uh, we already have the interpretation uh, up on the screen on, on this one, so that, that helps me. Um, but I'm going to walk through and see if I can justify it again. So this one, we have CT values uh, showing up. They're all in their 20s, so more DNA than the last example. Mm. Maybe this was a smear positive specimen. Yeah. Um, it looks like our yellow curve, so the SPC is good, so it's a valid result. And probe E, though, has zero, so um, no amplification uh, in probe E, and that, I think, is going to say there's a mutation in probe E. And uh, luckily, um, the calculation's already up there on the screen that um, that, that means that Delta CT is going to be more than four, obviously, because there's mm -hmm. a zero, and that means rifampin resistant. Yes, that's correct. And um, probe E is kind of um, special, okay? So most uh, common MDR um, has this mutation, um, 531 serine to leucine, okay? Um, but, you know, in, within this probe E, more than this mutation can be detected. The other one is disputed mutation, 533 CCG, but you know, disputed mutation uh, much, much less common. So, so let's, so uh, I think what we're saying here, right, is that a piece of information that you can call your lab to get is to find out which probe it was that resulted in the rifampin resistant result. Yeah. And probe E is where the most commonly encountered rifampin resistant result is. And so I know when I call you and I hear that it's probe E, I feel a little bit more confident about the MDR diagnosis. But I know it's not guaranteed. Not guaranteed. Because yeah. there are other mutations in probe E that are less common and less sure that it right. is MDR. Right. But so. you have the patient information, so you will, you know, no That's better than. That's right. That's where we have to bring in the, the patient information. Yeah. Um, so, Grace, one question that uh, comes up from time to time um, that I'd like to ask is whether expert can tell the difference or can help us differentiate between M. tuberculosis species from the larger M. tuberculosis complex. Um, can expert do that? I, well, it's not. It can't. It cannot. Okay. Okay. So why, you know, yeah. So there are so many species within that uh, TB complex, okay. And um, the the RPOV, that's, you know, uh, the gene, um, can all those uh, species within that complex has the same uh, sequence there. Same RPOV. Right. I right. see. Yeah. So at, that least, at least in that core region, okay. So it cannot identify specifically um, TB, you know, MTB, okay, yeah. But we should say MTBC to be scientifically correct, even right. though we know TB is most common. That's you know? right, okay. Yeah. So, so I guess when, if I later learn that a patient has uh, Mycobacterium bovis, for example, 
I shouldn't be concerned that the original expert result was wrong or that there were two um, species of mycobacterium there because probably it was just mycobacterium bovis that the expert assay was correctly picking up. Right, right, yeah. And here I want to mention, you know, um, previous, the one that uh, the very busy report from uh, gene expert computer, okay, on the top portion, it only says MTB detected. So it, it is not the right term to use that. So it should say MTBC detected. So I want to make sure that when you have the relief resistance and then you get that report, and then when you send to us, and then we say, and bovis, and then, oh my goodness, you know, my patient may be infected, you know, to, you know, um, TB, and then and bovis, and then should I still using, you know, PGA and not to take it out right. forever. So, so expert just tells us MTB complex. That's correct. Right. No matter what it says there, uh, okay. that's a busy report. Great. Yeah. Okay, well, I think now why don't we, um, talked about some of the basics of what's going on under the hood, as I keep saying, of the, the assay. And let's talk about some more difficult uh, cases and um, scenarios and see if we can apply this, um, this knowledge to uh, figure out some of the, the more nuanced uh, situations. Sure. So I think what we're going to cover here, the main things that we want to talk about are silent mutations. and. Um, you know, the expert software is great. It interprets uh, for us whether there's a mutation there or not. But a silent mutation that doesn't confer rifampin resistance, the expert machine doesn't know that. And so doesn't know. Only know mutation is there or not. Okay. And then I want to say one thing about silent mutation. Okay. Even though it has the nucleotide change. Okay. But it's the, it does not cause the amino acid change. So it's nothing to do with rifampin resistance. Right, yeah. no rifampin resistance associated with a silent mutation on POD. Yeah. Um, we've already alluded to smear negative uh, uh, specimens run on expert with a low MTB complex DNA level. Uh, we'll show a couple examples of where this may open up the opportunity for some uh, false uh, detection of rifampin resistance or very rarely um, false identification of uh, MTM as uh, MTB complex. And then the last uh, scenario situation that we're going to talk about is dead bugs. So basically, we all know the expert is looking for MTB complex DNA, but the assay doesn't know whether that's coming from an alive organism or an organism that's been dead for in some cases, a very long time. Okay, so we will have some examples to show, right? Yeah, and in fact, uh, here's the first case that uh, I'd like to tell you about. Um, so this is a 70-year-old man who was born in Mexico. I presented with cough, weight loss, and night sweats for a couple of months. Um, chest x-ray shows a left upper lobe infiltrate, and his sputum was smear positive. So it's certainly sounding pretty good for, uh, for TB. And uh, an expert uh, assay is is ordered. Um, so here's the here's the assay. Again, our interpretation uh, is uh, showing up on the screen. Um, but you know, I uh, I got this result back, and I have to say I was surprised. So mm. can you walk us through this result and your thinking about it? Yeah. Okay. So. Um, of course, first, when you get the report, you can see this, right? You only get the simple five reports that TB detected, uh, RIF resident detected, right? That's right. That's, that's, right. that's what we got. Okay. So I say, okay, get the, the detailed thing. Okay. okay. And then I saw the probe B. Okay. Then the probe B, um, I'm a little bit biased. I'm always thinking about, hey, probe B may be silent, okay? So, um, but let's take a look. Do we have some data to show the probe? Yeah, but let me make sure that I understand what we're looking at here. So CT value is zero for B, for yeah. probe B. We can see in the green line, that's the one that uh -huh. didn't amplify. And um, 
And so this looks like a valid result, right? Of course, yes. Um, and in fact, the CT values are under 30, so this might be a low smear positive uh, specimen. In fact, or, I said or, that. Or it still can be smear negative. It still can be. Yeah. On the on the border. On the border, there. yeah. But mm -hmm. but the actual assay results, um, we uh, we're sounding pretty confident in. I am confident the expert result is expert is doing fine. Okay, but the interpretation part we don't know. Right. Yeah. Okay. So um, probe B is where most common silent mutations are, and here's back to our diagram. I think this is what. Um, we're talking about the most silent mutation occurs at codon 514, which is covered by probe B. Mm -hmm. So again, a reminder that if you ask your lab what probe um, is uh, resulting in the rifampin resistance detection, probe B is a clue that um, that's where silent mutations yeah. are. But, but you can see the probe B covers, you know, from uh, 512 to 518. So possibility of, you know, that 514 mutation is only one of. So like probe <laughs> E, you can't take it to the bank, right? Uh, there are other <laughs> mutations covered by probe B um, that can be identified um, right. with the expert right. assay. Okay. So here comes a big surprise, you know. After we run pyrosequencing, we implement pyrosequencing, and we realize that, you know, uh, this silent thing is not, you know, not too silent, okay, because 20, more than 20% of all the mutations we detect in the RPOV core end up to be silent, okay. So the most common one is the 514 TTT, it just show us, right? And then, but let's look at the spec, you know, um, from that RPOV um, range, you know, yeah. Um, what percentage of mutation it can be detected? So 70% is this silent mutation. And then we have found some disputed mutations. Disputed mutation means that it's not silent, but when you run the phenotypic DST, like the, um, Midges, okay, you you will not see it recently resistant. That's why we call it disputed. Okay. And then there um, quite a few, you know, uh recent uh, resistant confirming uh mutations. Okay. So um I just don't know how you deal with this. And you know, many times when I say possible uh silent mutation turn out to be silent mutation. And then there was one time you know, I say, and yeah, okay, don't forget, 70%, you know, can be silent. And then you email me back, say, no way. And I was surprised. I say, how you are so sure? And then you can say, no way. Can you tell well, us? Well, I'm not sure I would say no way with 70%, but this is, I think the point is that um, you have to integrate your clinical uh, information with your expert result, right? So. Yeah. So yes. if I'm understanding what, what you're saying on this slide, Grace, is that um, in California anyway, where MDR is actually pretty uncommon, um, that 20% of these rifampin resistance um, results that you get at MDL when you do pyrosequencing, it turns out to be a silent mutation. Mm -hmm. And if we look at just the ones that have Pro-B as the result, 70% of those right. end up being right. silent mutations in, right. in California in our context. Right. But again, it's not the only one, and so that's where our clinical information right, comes right, in. Right, right, right. And I say, you say no way was the thing that I thought if this can be, and then the particular case, you say no way. That's because, uh, yeah. if I recall correctly, that case was from a country that had a high rate of uh, MDR. I think it was Peru, right? Yeah, I think yeah. so. And then four plus. Yeah, so yeah. smear positive, it was um, with maybe some other history where right. MDR made sense clinically in that situation. So I was less willing to uh, to explain that result by a silent mutation in right. B. And that, that's why, you know, uh, if if others calling me and then say, okay, B, I will not say, <laughs> uh, <coughs> 
uh, side of mutation, I, I, I should say, okay, how about the clinical situations and then, you know, whatever. So I think this is an opportunity to ask for additional testing and additional right. information, yeah. but um, not to uh, make a, a clear um, clinical decision without uh, without thinking about all of that. So um, we talked a little bit in that example, actually, about uh, how some of our epidemiology helps us to, uh, to interpret results. So this table that I'm showing here is just from California data, and it's the proportion in the percent column of uh, TB cases uh, among patients uh, born in countries, and what proportion of those were uh, MDR-TB. And I've ordered these from highest percent to lowest percent, um, and you can see that there's quite a range. Um, some of the countries from where uh, many of our uh, TB cases uh, were born, uh, Philippines, Vietnam, uh, China, Mexico are towards the bottom of this list where MDR is, uh, is less common. And the reason this is important is that if we think about positive predictive value of rifampin resistance and expert, um, the prevalence of uh, rifampin resistance, or MDR in this case, makes a big, uh, big difference. So let me add those columns for positive predictive value of 99% specificity and 98% specificity. And what I think you can uh, get a sense of here is that um, the positive predictive value, so the proportion of those rifampin resistant results that are going to be truly rifampin resistant resistance starts to, um, to tail off pretty quickly. And so if you get down to 2% uh, there with Ethiopia and Philippines, positive predictive, predictive value is actually you know, two-thirds or a coin flip um, in terms of uh, being actual or FAMPEN resistant. So in California, what we typically, uh, you know, I look at this list and I think about this 2% threshold um, when I'm interpreting expert results um, because I am a lot more concerned clinically if there's an MDR risk like MDR being common um, in, um, in that person's uh, uh, country. Um, and then when we've looked at uh, also um, time in the U.S. and the same data, um, and I'm showing that here for all countries except for uh, the U.S. and some of our other uh, common uh, countries uh, with TB. Um, you can see that looking at uh, persons who've only been in the U.S. for a couple of years, um, that the proportion MDR is above this 2% threshold, so I kind of weigh this as well when I'm thinking about the likelihood of uh, real um, uh, rifampin resistance uh, expert assay um, is time in the U.S. as well as um, a country that the person was, had been born in. Um, so this, I think, is very helpful. Um, you know, there also, uh, the flip side is, is also the case. So I've been, we've been talking today about how you interpret expert results. But I think it's important for us to remember when to order an expert or order pyro sequencing if one hasn't been ordered already. So think about these MDR risk factors, prior TB treatment, contact a patient with drug-resistant TB, um, looking at the MDR risk by country of origin and time in the U.S., thinking about uh, HIV as well. And the reason for this reminder is we have done um, an analysis looking at our MDR cases, and among 42 smear-positive MDR cases who had one of these risk factors, about 20 of them actually uh, did not get expert or pyro sequencing performed on that uh, smear positive sputum, meaning that it took quite a bit longer to identify uh, MDR in those patients. So just a reminder um, for our audience to think about MDR risk factors and order a molecular test if one hasn't been ordered mm, sure. already. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so Grace, you asked me a little bit more about Pro-B interpretation, and uh, we've talked about these risk factors, and so again, we'll come back to this and have already interpreted in clinical context. What are the risks in that patient for drug-resistant TB? Along with, clinically, is there a pressing need to start TB treatment immediately um, for public health reasons or for clinical reasons? 
coming back to the example case, this case was born in Mexico. There's no prior TB treatment. There's not a contact to a person with uh, MDR-TB. And so our assessment was this was probably silent. And luckily, you were able to tell us within um, 24 hours of receiving the specimen that indeed this was a silent mutation yeah. identified by probe B of the expert yeah. assay. So at that time, you will not start and you, know, you, you would wait, you know, even one day or two days, you know. Typically, and, we're able to, mm -hmm. to wait for the sequencing results um, to come back. Okay. And then how about that uh, Peru case? Okay. We did get the title out, okay. And then it was uh, 516 That's right. mutation. So and then I would say, yes, Kenna was right. You know. <laughs> Well, again, it's just a matter of thinking about those drug resistant right. um, right. um, risk factors and uh, the clinical history right. in right. in making this determination. Right. Uh, but once again, sequencing is what really uh, cinched it for us. Um, there are some situations, though, where there's not enough DNA for sequencing, right. um, where we have an expert result, but there's not enough DNA for prior sequencing, and we are stuck at least until the culture grows and we get right. phenotypic drug susceptibility right. tests with this judgment um, about uh, likelihood of MDR based on the expert right. result. And then while you're waiting for culture to grow, maybe you, you, do you think older another student has a better quality of spit? That may, may well, uh, have a yes. clear positive or whatever? Yes, but in this situation, we were very confident about probe B, right? Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. not going to yeah. help us. Right, right, right. Not, not for this case, but I mean, you know, is it uh, smear negative and then um, pyro yellow, no sequence? It, if know. we can yeah. get a specimen that's smear positive, um, we would submit it to you for right. sequencing right. for sure, yeah. for sure. Well, let's talk a little bit more about smear mm -hmm. negatives, and um, let me tell you about uh, this second case, um, Grace. So this is a 40-year-old um, uh, woman who's had a cough for about a month, no prior TB treatment, and she was born in a country with low MDR uh, prevalence, hadn't traveled, um, and uh, was a known contact to a household case that had been pan-susceptible um, a year before, um, but hadn't um, received LCBI uh, treatment as a result of that, uh, of that contact. So here, um, and let me just say here's her chest x-ray with a uh, left upper lobe uh, cavitary lesion there. So, you know, very, um, very much thinking that uh, this is likely to be TB. Not a lot of risk factors uh, going for uh, MDR-TB. And uh, here is the uh, expert result that, mm -hmm. uh, that came from uh, this patient's um, sputum, mm -hmm. which was uh, smear negative. Right. Um, and uh, the rifampin, or the expert uh, result, I was very surprised by before I got to the lab to see these numbers because it reported out rifampin mm -hmm. resistance. Exactly. That's okay. right. So, can you walk us through why the, the computer said that? <laughs> okay. So now we have to, you know, check the CG values mm. to see if that math works, right? Okay. So first, okay, um, every probe is up, okay, then TV detect no problem, okay. I and think then, that's why I was confused because there was no probe that was zero. Right, 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 okay. But then look at the uh, mixed mass CT difference, okay. So what is the highest CT value? 33.8, that's probe E, right? And the lowest one is uh, C, 29.7. So you do a mass, that's 4.1, right? Well, just then, over the threshold. Yeah. Yeah. So is it mag magic? Uh, number four magic. <laughs> right, right. So let me put the math up up here for uh, for the audience. So remember that the expert software calls rifampin resistance if this math, just this uh, this little equation, is, the result is 4.1 or higher. So this case just barely got called rifampin resistant. Okay. And then what what did I say to you when you called me about this? <laughs> I um, said I don't trust it. 
That's right. Um, and um, I was confused looking at the curves. I was confused thinking about the clinical situation because I really wasn't right. thinking that this right. was going to be MDR. Right. And so um, I was surprised. And I think the other suggestion you had in this situation was maybe you should repeat uh, the specimen. Definitely. The expert. So, yeah. um, so I counseled the patient to really uh, collect a good early morning uh, specimen. Um, and um, and this was the repeat. You can see again. Um, this was uh, uh, taken directly from the screen in the in the lab. Um, and uh, the CT values here on the repeat uh, specimen one are slightly lower, so maybe a little bit more DNA, DNA in right. the specimen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, you can't appreciate it by just looking at the curves, but if you do the math on right. the CT values. Uh, this repeat showed that rifampin was not detected and this delta CT was actually 2.9, which fit with the clinical situation mm -hmm. um, and the CT values were a little bit lower and so um, we felt more confident yes. about about this result. Right, definitely. And then I will not say, okay, the first one you got, you know, RIF detect, the second one RIF not detect and it's a discrepancy. I will not feel that way. Right. Know, yeah. And so then, no use in ordering a third tiebreaker. No, okay. no. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. And then it's all, it's because, you know, when the DNA concentration is borderline, okay, and a little bit earlier to have a primer bind to mm -hmm. the, the DNA segment, and then it will get, you know, um, entry count get a little bit more, and then you're going to get this kind of thing, okay. So it's not really, you know, something that you have to worry about. It's a discrepancy. Right, so I see. So in that, thinking back to the PCR reaction, right. when we're starting with a low number of DNA, um, that just the variability of how that reaction proceeds and how right. the probes bind are enough right. in low DNA situations to have there be a little bit of a spread. A little bit of variability, you know, um, between the runs. In the CT value. In the CT value. Yeah. Okay. So um, this back to our case here. You know, we based on this treated the patient with standard first line therapy, and actually the patient improved after about a week. Unfortunately, this is a situation where there wasn't enough DNA to uh, get a sequencing result. But um, I think we weren't surprised, but we were happy to see that when the final phenotypic drug susceptibility test results came back, this patient's isolate was pan-susceptible. So, yeah. so, so if um, in this situation, you know, you really want to confirm, you know, for you to feel 100 percent, you know, comfortable that this is not, you know, risk resistant, you know, you can, you don't have to wait till DST come up because it will take longer, right? So I think as a culture of Tempasti, you know, um, welcome you to send it to us. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. So again, mm -hmm. sequencing really helps right. um, yeah. in these situations. Um, so uh, let's look back at some of the data on, um, on smear negative um, compared with, uh, with culture. So um, here's some data about um, the difference in sensitivity for expert on smear negative specimens between one and two specimens. So 59% with one. 71% with two, so you do gain something from collecting and running a second uh, specimen. So many clinicians, I think, do order right off the bat um, two, um, two experts. But, but do you have to, to say, no matter what, do two? Well, um, let's look at, I, I think that uh, if the first one is positive, you would consider that to be a, a right. good result. But Let's, uh, let's show an example yeah. of, of where multiple experts uh, may not have been uh, helpful. helpful. Um, okay, so this third case, 50-year-old man, uh, born in Mexico, been in the U.S. for 10 years, cough, sweats, nodular infiltrate, again, no MDR contact, no prior treatment, so no MDR risk factors here, does seem like TB, uh, smears are negative, um, and two experts were, were ordered. Um, so here's the first one. Uh, the first one 
did not find MTB at all. You can see all the CT values are zero, so, um, so a negative uh, result. Um, so the second one was run, and here MTB was detected, rifampin resistance was not detected, and if you do the math, that works out on these CT values. Um, but I think maybe there was some worry about, well, one was negative, the other was positive. Should we get additional specimens to confirm this positive um, expert result? But, but actually, we should not, right? Well, I think here um, we'd want to look at the curve, but I think this result of TB makes the TB diagnosis to me, and it fits with the clinical um, right. scenario. And, and the, the second report also legitimate. It's not, you know, um, um, fuzzy or whatever. Right, you know? right. Yeah. But so a third specimen was done. And uh, this one showed, again, MTB detected. So we've confirmed that this mm -hmm. patient has, uh, has TB. Um, but uh, this time, rifampin resistance, uh, the expert computer said it was indeterminate. The CT values were actually too high, too high. For, uh, for the machine to, to uh, make a determination. So actually, a fourth specimen was run. Um, and this one is here, and now we again have confirmed MTB, but now rifampin resistance has been detected um, because the delta CT was more than four. So yeah. okay. here, so as you put on the slide here, <laughs> in this scenario, we've hit the jackpot. We have four tests, four different results on uh, clinically. Um, what do we do uh, about that? Right. Right. So. And then look at the, the sample four, okay. The, again, it's a CT, uh, delta CT maximum is 4.1, you know. Another 4.1. Another 4.1, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so 4.1, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't trust it. Yeah. Well, again, I think we go back to our clinical risk factors, right? No right. risk factors for MDR-TB in this situation. It's a low DNA specimen, all smear negative, all pretty much high, T, high CT values. And uh, so we have to kind of question, I think, this rifampin resistant result. And really, in retrospect, stopping after the second specimen. Right. Or right. if that first specimen had been positive, then stopping after the first. Then you don't even to do the second one. Yeah. Right. Okay. So just to summarize some of the issues with testing smear negatives, uh, mostly comes from the low amount of DNA present in smear negative specimens. Keep in mind that experts' detection limit is about 120 uh, organisms um, in, the, in the specimen, um, and the expert results in that situation are less reproducible because we're starting with fewer organisms. There's more variability in that uh, PCR uh, reaction that can vary between between runs, and you start getting into these issues of delta CT max being just over that threshold. And so I think our message here about smear negatives is just keep in mind if you're surprised with the result to ask for more uh, information or think a little bit more about the result that you're getting. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if you can wait for cultural weight, the clinical situation justified. Or you know, if you really desperate to do another test, get a good quality specimen, right. and then good volume. You know. Yeah. Right. So uh, on this slide, we are kind of boiling down some of these recommendations that you know, if MTB is not detected, keep in mind it doesn't rule out MTB because that could still be culture positive in the right uh, scenario. Consider getting a second expert result or waiting for culture results. If MTB complex is detected, or rifampin resistance is not detected, we think this is probably the most reliable result. Right, you don't need to order. You know, probably don't need to, yeah. to confirm it. I mean, I think there are very rare situations that we've encountered, but uh, in general, it's the most reliable. If MTB is detected and rifampin resistance is also detected, keep in mind to confirm that by sequencing, incorporate your clinical information, um, epidemiologic information into that interpretation. And then if, you know, the, um, the CT, Delta CT, you know, just slightly over four or whatever, I think it's legitimate to consider to repeat. Repeat, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. We didn't really talk too much about rifampin resistant being indeterminate, but I think, again, this 
uh, stems from having low amount of DNA in the specimen and uh, repeating um, is a reasonable course reasonable. of action with rifampin uh, indeterminate uh, specimens. So, um, Grace, um, two probes positive. Um, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about that uh, part of the expert software algorithm. Right. You know, I really feel um, if this is testing um, on the smear negative, okay, having two probes up to make it a rule to determine can be detected. I think it's too dangerous, you know. Yeah. And looking at some of our data, you know, MDL's data, um, we have very, very rare to detect um, three mutations. Okay. For example, two probes up means three probes down, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then each probe, at least one mutation is there, right? So when you have only two probes, means three or more mutations, right? Okay. So um, out of um, almost 3,800 specimen tested, we had only two samples that had the three mutations, okay? And those two samples, okay, one is detected by probe, uh, by two probes, probe A and probe B, and then one is detected by probe D. So we never ever have one that it can be detected by three probes. At, so at least in your lab. Huh? At least in your lab, right? Among right, 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 yeah. right, right. So yeah. not impossible, but, yeah. but very rare. Very, very rare. You know. So yeah. I think, you know, this is rare. We've seen it, this uh, a couple of times, uh, at least this, uh, this happened. Um, and, and then uh, turn out to be NTM, you know. Right. Yeah. So, I think again, like the rest of our messages here, that if you're surprised by the results, ask your lab for more information. And if it's still surprising or not consistent with what you're expecting, definitely think a little bit harder um, about about what could explain that result. Yeah, that's right. Because you know, when only two probes positive, they call it you know, they you do not know how many probes, right? You only need ah. Uh, can be detected, risk detected, right? Okay, right. so definitely you want to ask for that CV raw report. That's right. And then we can right. discuss more. That's right, very helpful. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think we're not going to talk uh, more, but it is more common to have two mutations and have two probes down. And I've uh, definitely been uh, made humble by declaring two probes uh, down meant um, that it. I was suspicious or surprised about it, but um, we do see that um, rarely. But having two mutations is more common for sure than having three mutations. Right. Yeah. Even it, it's um, I, I don't I don't say it's a lot, okay. But we may see you know two a year or something, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And we do include you know one of the the um, the two mutations. Um, in your extra slides. Right. Yeah. yeah. So um, you touched upon uh, non TB mycobacteria, and keep in mind that we talked about this rare situation uh, about smear negative and only two probes positive. I think it bears in mind reminding about the situation when you have smear positive but a negative expert, that this is another reason you should think about uh, non tuberculous mycobacteria. Right. So um, my last question uh, is, can we use expert for detection of relapses? And I'm going to go through this uh, quickly. Uh, this case was actually uh, published a few years ago. Uh, but the situation was an older man from China who five years prior had been treated for cavitary TB and had been cured. But he presented to the emergency room with two days of shortness of breath, no fever, night sweats, or weight loss. In fact, he had weight gain. His chest x-ray showed bilateral pleural effusion, so not uh, the cavitary lesion um, that he'd seen with uh, his original TB. He was smear negative, expert positive. I think sputum may not have been collected even, except that for this history. And that showed rifampin resistance in probe A. Um, 
there was no sequence detected when we sent it to Grace for pyrus sequencing, and the culture grew a rapid grower. Multiple other specimens were expert negative. Um, and then we looked back and we found that the original isolate from five years prior showed a mutation in codon 511, which is detectable by probe A. Yeah. Well, actually, during this uh, investigation, okay, so at that time, we were using molecular beta, okay, and we didn't have the, the probe A area because, you know, a mutation detected by probe A is much, much um, uncommon. So at that time, we didn't have that, okay. So we uh, retrieved the DNA, and then we run pilot sequencing, and then we found out it's 511, okay, CCG. And this one can be detected by probe A. And the, the, the recent one was detected by probe A. And then I remember that the patient um, went back to, to China before this episode, mm. right? So uh, clinically, this was difficult because the history was concerning for MDR. Could this be a relapse? Uh, but the clinical presentation was actually kind of atypical for TB, more compatible with uh, heart failure uh, exacerbation. Did get treated for a couple weeks, but then uh, then got uh, his TB treatment got stopped. All cultures ended up being uh, negative for MTB, including several additional sets a year later, and in the end, we concluded that the negative cultures and the same RPOB mutation as prior um, indicated probably the expert assay was uh, picking up dead bugs, but um, and still um, no um, no recurrence in in this patient. But just a reminder here that again, expert is picking up DNA. It doesn't matter uh, necessarily whether it's from a live organism or a dead organism. Here is a uh, graph from uh, a study showing that at the end of six months in that purple line, 27% uh, of persons who are cured of TB uh, will be expert positive at the end of treatment, and other case reports have shown that patients can be expert positive for uh, five years um, and, uh, and beyond. So just a caution about ordering expert after treatment start or in previously treated patients. Expert can't determine whether it's alive or dead, and this a positive result can be really confusing. In fact, the package insert recommends against um, getting an expert in anyone treated for three days um, or more, or for more than three days, and if you order it, you have to think about how you're going to interpret their results. It's only probably helpful if you're going to, if you get a different Rifampin result from what uh, you anticipate or what had been documented uh, prior, and that's a limited um, situation. Um, so caution about getting expert in somebody who's been previously treated. All right, Grace, well, we've chatted about a lot of different situations. We haven't covered uh, everything, of course, but um, I think in summary, uh, what we want to communicate, we hope that our audience has taken out, is uh, remember to order expert um, to diagnose TB in your patients and in patients with MDR uh, uh, risk factors. And keep alert for if the results surprise you, uh, talk to your lab. Ask for that probe information. Ask for the CT uh, values. Think about the clinical context of your patient. Are there MDR risk factors that make a rifampin-resistant result more likely? Can you wait for culture results before making a final determination? Get sequencing on all rifampin-resistant specimens, but keep in mind that in smear negative, particularly if the CT value is more than 28, you may need to wait for, uh, for um, culture. Yeah, it is because uh, PSQ is uh, less sensitive than expert. So if the CD value greater than 28, it's unlikely that uh, pyro will be successful. Yeah. Right. But we are happy, you know, when the culture turns positive, as soon as it turns positive, the smear shows ropey, you know, send it over. You don't have to um, use uh, other methods, you know. 
um, the actual probe collaborator to identify before you send it to us. We can accept that. Yeah. Great. Well, I think both of us want to acknowledge that it's not just uh, us who are working on uh, this presentation or our work, um, but there are big teams, MDR service, um, and uh, the folks in your lab, um, as well as some other folks who helped us uh, with this presentation. So we'd like to thank them. And um, I think we have time to take questions um, now, but uh, if questions come up in the future, here are our uh, email addresses, and uh, we also have a couple of other slides and resources um, in the uh, in the slide set. Okay. We have one right here. Okay, so it looks like uh, some questions are coming in through the chat. Maybe the first one from uh, Lisa. How do you interpret results in someone with no history of TB treatment, expert positive? culture negative, no TB symptoms. Well, so here, um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, I think you have to think about why the test was run in the first place. Um, and, um, you know, like any, I guess, whether it's a culture or a smear or an expert result in somebody with very little suspicion of TB, um, you have to question that a little bit, um, but um, and think about other sources of, of positive, right? Mm. Um, so uh, could there be contamination somehow? Could it be a false positive uh, culture? Um, but these situations are very difficult and confusing um, to uh, to deal with. Uh, I don't know, but maybe there's a question for you, Grace, whether there are any clues that you could look at on expert or another result to help with that uh, in this situation where it sounds to me like there's very little suspicion actually for active TB. Right. And if the expert says TB detected, no brief detected, usually the test is correct, mm -hmm. you know, I mean mechanically. Is correct, okay. But as you mentioned, you know, if this culture or this um, this specimen belong to the patient, sometimes you know the um, labeling errors. We have to consider that. So maybe get another specimen to test to see if reproducible. Yeah. If reproducible, you have to think about something else. For example, like the case um, um, previous. He maybe exposed, but um, wasn't treated. You know, didn't have the clinical manifestation, um, and then re was not treated, and then resolved, and then they can come up and the stack bus there. Is right. it possible? Well, maybe. I mean, this scenario we're given is no history of TB in the past, so. Uh, but sometimes TB you, you don't know, right? right? Like a TB four kind of prior fibrosis. Yeah, maybe. Right. Right. And then, but I think you know, repeat the test will be meaningful to see if it's reproducible. Right. Yeah. So we have another question here from John Jerob. Um, Iger result and chest X-ray for that last scenario. So um, I don't remember the Iger result, but this is a guy who'd had uh, active TB microbiologically confirmed in the past. Um, you know, maybe Iger would help us a little bit if it had been negative. Um, although not the typical use of, of IGRA in that situation. I don't remember that, uh, that result. Chest x-ray uh, was bilateral pleural effusion. Um, oh, John Jarab meant, I meant Lisa's question um, in turn, IGRA result and chest x-ray. So yeah, I think reinforcing that, um, that uh, the more information you have in that situation, um, the, the better. Um, while we're waiting for that. Um, if we have any questions uh, from participants on the phone, you can press star six to unmute yourself. So we'll wait a couple moments here. Um, we have a question from the California TB branch. Um, in a case you have suspicion for NTM, if expert is positive for MTB complex, is this specific enough for MTB? So um, I think with the rare caveat that we talked about a little bit in our discussion where there are two probes, 
only that are positive. If it's not a situation like that, yes, um, that would be sufficient to identify uh, MTB. Um, and so, um, so even if you have both an NTM and MTB there, the expert will identify MTB complex. Is that right? That's right. Grace? Yeah. The primer has a specificity. Yeah. Right. Right. So you don't have to worry. And in fact, that's a great use of uh, pyro sequencing um, for molecular tests is when there is overgrowth by, by NTM. Mm -hmm. Do we have any questions on the phone? Hmm. Looks like we don't have IGRA and chest x-ray results for the scenario Lisa is asking about. I think we have a few more, uh, for more minutes for questions, if anybody uh, has any. Um, well, should we talk the um, expert ultra just a little bit? Mm. Sure. Um, why don't we um, go to the additional um, additional slides? And um, you may know that there's a new the next uh, expert um, uh, product is uh, coming out. Yeah, it, it has been used. WHO, you know, endorse it, and then they should replace the Z4, the current format, you know, but it's not available in the United States. Okay. And uh, the extra um, ultra is a little bit different. Okay, um, it does have two specific targets uh, for identification of um, MTB complex. And those are inserting sequence, okay, IX6110 and IX1085. I think with this, um, uh, falsely identified um, uh, NTM as TB, I think it will be greatly reduced. It will be better for It will be much, much better, you know, yeah. And it increases sensitivity for TB detection from 66% uh, to 79%. And it has uh, additional steps, you know, to analyze melting temperature, TM, uh, for identification of specific mutations. I think this is a good improvement. Okay. So um, instead of using five regular beacons, they use four sloppy beacons. And sloppy beacons means, you know, the head part is longer, about 40 nucleotides. Okay. Um, and then because the head is longer, so it's more tolerant. It's not like you know, current one is choosy. If you have mutation, I'm not going to hybridize it to it. Instead, the sloppy molecular beacon will tolerate it. You know, okay, I still can. You know, uh, we still can bind together and then have a generate uh, uh, signals. And then after the ultra detect, you know. Um, mutation is present, okay, so extra step is to analyze the melting temperature. And the melting temperature usually is quite specific for um, each mutation, okay. And, but I would imagine that, you know, if there are so many mutations, may, some of them may be overlap, okay. So, so great bottom line of expert ultra, it sounds like, is it's more sensitive for diagnosing TB in a specimen, um, and the other major advance relevant to what we've been talking about today is that we won't hopefully have to worry about the silent that mutation, mutation. Um, right. but we also um, are not sure whether it's going to be available in the United States. Right. I have a contact with them and then uh, haven't uh, get it yet. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, looks like no other questions have come through uh, in the chat um, or on the phone. Um, maybe Actually, one coming in. We might have one last one, the All last right. couple of minutes. And if any questions come in after the webinar, you can share them with the Curry Center and we'll compile them and share them with the presenters. Also want to thank everybody for uh, tearing themselves
themselves away from the high level meeting at the UN today. It's an exciting day for, uh, <laughs> for TV. Yeah, I'm very happy to work with you on this. Well, thanks, yeah. Grace. No, there's mm -hmm. a lot of mutual respect. Sounds like we will um, maybe hear um, more about that scenario in, a, in another way, about the other questions. So it sounds like no other, no other questions. Yeah, and then I would like to thank uh, County Laboratories. They provide me some special cases so I can put together for this presentation. Right, and thanks for the Curry Center. And thank you so much to our presenters.